Now, to our main event, I want to invite Executive in Residence, University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, Jill Pelisek, to introduce our speaker. Jill? Nikki, Nikki Otten is Associate Corrector of Prints and Drawings at the Milwaukee Art Museum. She plans exhibitions and rotations, manages acquisitions, and researches the collections of works on paper from the 15th up to the 21st century. Since arriving at the museum in 2018, she's curated the major exhibition, the one you're going to be hearing about. It only took her three years to put together. Uh, the posters, uh, excuse me, uh, always knew the posters of Jules Jure and also the Landfill Press, five decades of printmaking. She's also organized several focus exhibition drawn from the museum's outstanding collection. Previously, Otten held fellowships and internships at the Weisman Art Museum at the University of Minnesota, the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia, and the Minneapolis Institute of Art. She holds a PhD in art history from the University of Minnesota, uh, where she completed a, dis a dissertation that examines how the telescope and microscope influenced symbolist art artistic visions in the 19th century. So we're very excited to hear from her today. So please give a warm rotary welcome to Nikki Up. Thank you for being here. I'm very delighted to speak to you today. Thank you so much for the invitation. So I'll be talking to you today about an exhibition called Always New, the posters of Jules Chéret. It will be on view in the museum's Baker Rowland Galleries until October 16th of this year. The exhibition celebrates the artist Jules Chéret as an innovative figure in the history of the poster. Do you see him on your left side. So he is presenting himself here as a very cultured gentleman in his studio. So you'll see that he's sitting in front of a pastel or a painting, and he also has a lute, some fencing appies, and a fencing glove in the photograph, along with the posters for which he's best known. On the right side, you'll see a photograph of Jim and Susie Wickman in their former home on Newberry Avenue in Milwaukee. And the exhibition also celebrates the gift that the Wickmans gave to the museum of more than 600 posters, prints, and drawings by Jules Chéret. And that gift makes the Milwaukee Art Museum the holder of the largest collection of works by Jules Chéret in the United States. So we are very happy and grateful to steward the gift from the Wickmans. They started collecting Chéret's work when they saw it on display in San Francisco when they were vacationing there in 1983. And they both fell in love with this iconic female figure who came to be known as the Chéret. And they were really drawn to her liveliness and joyfulness. And Susie Wickman has said it's the first time that she and Jim ever agreed on artwork that they both liked. So <laughs> they went on to collect his work and over the next 30 years, we're able to build that significant collection that we talked about. The exhibition features 105 works from the Wickman's collection. So I'll give you an overview now. The main theme of the exhibition is the ephemerality of these posters and also the products that they advertised and how this you know, constant transformation was related to an interest in novelty and rapid change at the end of the 19th century. 
When I was researching the exhibition, I kept coming back to this quotation written by a British journalist who was traveling in Paris. And this, this text kind of sums up the way that many people in the public felt about posters and Chauvet's work in particular. So he, his, he goes by the initials PMH, and he was writing for the Pall Mall Gazette. It must be ad admitted, however, that all the admiration in the world cannot save these ephemeral productions from the fate of their kind. The very objects they announce are forgotten twixt sunset and sunrise. Their brilliant colors vanish under the wear and tear of the elements, not to mention the gratuitous insults of street urchins and the encroachments of rival posters, which swoop down by the hundreds in all the arrogance of fresh print and paint. So that's an encapsulation of how these posters changed over almost constantly. That text is featured on the wall in an introductory section of the exhibition that's meant to provide more of a background about Jules Chauvet and also how posters would have been made and distributed at the time. Chauvet was born in Paris in 1836 and he started apprenticing with a lithographer at the age of 13. And once he completed his training, he worked with several different print workshops in Paris, and he created decorative motifs, lettering, and sheet music covers. He moved to London in 1859, and he got a job with fellow expatriate and perfume perfumer Eugene Rimmel of Rimmel Cosmetics. In London, working for Rimmel, he would have created small chromolithographs, promotional items, like the almanac that you see on the screen here. So Chauvet would have designed something like this. This is only about two inches tall. So if you're thinking about the difference in scale between that and some of the posters, it's pretty incredible. While he was in London, Chauvet also would have seen color illustrated posters on the streets because that was a lot more common in London at the time than it was in Paris. What he would have seen is something like the image on the left so you can see that posters at the time were much more text heavy, and if they did have illustrations, they were smaller and printed from woodblock. The example on the right is one of the earliest posters that Chauvet made after he founded his own press back in Paris in 1867. And this is a lithograph poster where you wouldn't have to print the text and the image separately, but the composition shows how influenced he was by that earlier form of woodblock poster. Later on in his career, shortly after that poster was made, Chauvet started to integrate the text and images of his poster much more harmoniously, and that's something that he became recognized for over the course of his career. He also innovated a process of printing lithographs that made it possible to print color posters for the types of short-lived entertainments that he was advertising. So with lithography, it's done on a slab of prepared limestone that the artist or the printer draws on, and you need to make a new stone and for every color that you see on the poster, and you run this, the poster through the press on each of those stones. So you need as many stones as the number of colors that you see. So the more stones, the more labor intensive, the more expensive. Chauvet developed a process where he printed from only three stones. So he had one in red, one in black, and one that had a gradient background that went from orange or red at the bottom to blue or green at the top. So both of these posters on the screen are great examples of that technique, and it made it appear as though there were quite a number of more colors in the poster than there actually were. In 1881, Chauvet merged his own press with a company called Empemple Shakes, and that company printed railroad maps and timetables and also newspapers. He became artistic director of the company, and because of that, he gained access to uh, quite a number of employees and also a fleet of these steam-powered presses, which you see in the images on the screen. In the image on the left, you also see an enormous lithography stone. So that's a big piece of limestone. So just think about how heavy it would be to pick that stone up from the slab that it's on and somehow get it into the bed of the press. So that's a, it's a very physical process. At the same time that Chauvet became artistic director for Shakes, there were also innovations in um, 
in transportation networks. So transportation networks were growing at the same time, and that made it possible to ship goods and printed materials around the country much more quickly. Both of these posters are for poster distribution companies. So those would have been the people who were shipping posters around the country and actually pasting them up on the walls. In 1881, there was also a law passed in France that reduced the restrictions on approval and display of posters. So that legislation combined with these new technologies led to a proliferation of posters in the streets. And that's where Chaffey comes in. It's also around this time that he becomes quite a bit more recognized in the press and magazines. This painting by Louis Robert cartier belouz gives a good sense of Chéret's popularity with the public. So you see on the left a group of nine recognizable posters by Chéret that are behind a metal worker's stand. And the posters on the right have been up longer, they've begun to deteriorate in the elements, they're starting to peel down off of the wall, they're faded, they're torn. So a lot of Chéret's contemporaries commented on the loss of posters as a loss of historical information. But the couple that are looking at the posters don't seem to mind that at all, and instead they're looking for the latest and the greatest thing. They, uh, as a couple, provide an encapsulation of that interest in novelty at the end of the century. So these are the nine posters that Chaclay designed. So these were actually done over the course of nine years. So it's very unlikely that they would have all been pasted in the street at the same time. But rather, this painting shows us an example of the hold that Chaclay had on the public imagination. And then finally, in the introductory section of the exhibition, there is a contemporary poster by Erica Walker. And we commissioned this work from her in order to publicize the exhibition. You can see that she's incorporated some of Chéret's figure types that he used often, like a clown and cherubs. And she's also incorporated elements of a printing press on the right side of the work. And that allowed her to reference her own artistic practice because she often uses historical machinery when she makes prints. And in fact, this machine is the very machine that the posters were printed on. So we worked with a printing company called, um, called Black Rock Editions in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they run a, rest a restored 19th century Boran printing press that's belt driven. So the machine that's referenced in the poster is the machine that we were able to print it on. So it's a nice connection that this contemporary poster was printed on the same type of press that Chéret would have used in the 19th century. And it also demonstrates Chéret's ongoing relevance for contemporary printmakers. With that stage set, we move into the first of five major sections of the exhibition, and each of those sections is based on an industry for which Chéret would have created advertisements. So the first of those is called Novelty Acts and focuses on cabaret performers and spectacle. There were quite a number of new performance venues that opened in Paris at the end of the 19th century, and by some estimates, there were 1,000 cafe concerts in Paris by 1885. So because of this, cabaret directors were always seeking out new entertainment that would keep their audiences interested and outdo the rival venues that we, they were competing with. Both of these posters advertise acts at the Folie Berger Cabaret, which is still there. I don't know if any of you have been. But the person on the left is a performer named Jefferson the Manfish, and he was an American performer. And his act consisted of diving into a tank of water, and he spent 45 minutes under there drinking, sleeping, writing, and smoking. So Chéret has chosen to show him smoking and swimming at the same time. You can see a little puff of smoke coming out of his mouth if you look carefully. I uh, looked at some reviews of his act in French newspapers, and one of the reviewers said, God knows what else he would do if the matter weren't taking place in public. So he <laughs> did quite a lot of activities under the water. And then he came out and conducted the orchestra afterward to show that he was still alive and doing well. The performer on the right is named Delmonico, and he was also American. He was from Delaware, and he was known for his acts and also for his publicity stunts. 
the one example, he made a dummy of himself and threw it on the stage, and his animals ate it, so he staged his own death only to reappear miraculously a short time later. For the cabaret directors who were scheduling these venues, they often looked for unfamiliarity, so that made acts more popular very often. That unfamiliarity could come from great physical capabilities or daring, like both of these men had, but it could also come from the performer's nationality or gender or race. So Jefferson played up his American nationality by calling himself after an American president, and Delmonico's publicity always referenced the fact that he was black, and reviews of his shows usually mentioned Africa or the tropics, even though he was from Delaware. So to some extent, he created that connection with Africa himself, but I think a lot of it was constructed for him by the cabaret directors as well. Loie Fuller was another American performer, and she made her debut in Paris in 1892. She was very well known for her innovative style of dance, which involved whirling these hundreds of yards of fabric around her body while she moved on stage. And she projected colored lights onto that fabric, so it created this shimmering effect of motion and light over her body. And Chaclay does a great job of capturing that in this poster that he made for some of her engagements at the Folie Berger. Fuller's use of this innovative choreography and lighting effects allowed her to create a representation of forms from nature. So she often created the impression of lilies or fire or butterflies. And she enraptured her audiences by creating a number of these forms in succession during her performances. This image is probably Chechle's most iconic. Even if you know nothing about Chechle, it's likely that you've seen this image somewhere out in the world. And this poster advertises the Moulin Rouge, which is also still there. It had recently opened at the time that Chechle made this poster. This is the first use of the female figure who came to be known as the Chechette. And she is a very lively, very joyful figure. She's somewhat scantily clad, and she usually looks like she's weightless or hovering, as, in, as is the case in this poster where she's being carried by a donkey down from Montmartre. Chechet's critics were very enamored with the Chechet, as you might imagine. So, for example, René Ducroy wrote, we have, before these sparkling posters, the vision of encountering a new country, of entering a paradise. And what a paradise, populated with what women? Oh, the women of Chechet. The critics really responded well to the Chechet. Chaclet began to use the Chaclet in many of his campaigns in the 1890s, and you can see her here in these posters advertising different, uh, different engagements at the Musée Clévin. Chaclet became the artistic director of the Musée Clévin in 1891, and he used a version of the Chaclet in a specific pose where she's holding the hem of her dress in her hands to advertise different entertainments that, have, that took place at the Musée Clévin. The Musée Clévin had opened in 1882. It was a wax museum. It's also still there. And it was a very, very popular venue and attracted half a million visitors every year. They added a theater to the venue in 1900. And both of the, this poster advertises an attraction at the theater. Chaclet painted the same scene onto the curtain of the theater. So you can see the female figures leading this group of clowns down from the hill of Montmartre. So it references the kind of gaiety of the Paris streets. As the, at the time that this poster was made in 1900, Chaclay was more respected as an artist rather than a commercial person. And different people wanted to collect his work. So he started to make versions of his posters without the advertising text, as you can see in the example on the right. So this poster would have been created specifically for connoisseurs and collectors. The second section is La Mode de Paris, which focuses on fashion and department stores. And the retail industry in Paris changed quite significantly in the 1830s when this new type of store called Magasin de Nouveauté started to appear. 
And they introduced many different retailing practices, like offering a different, a lot of different types of goods in one store. And they also had free entry and fixed prices and courteous service. They charged lower prices as well, and they relied on publicity to create a greater turnover of their goods and still earn a profit. Many of them used Chere to create posters for their stores. So the La Magicien poster on the left uses a whimsical magician to create interest in the store among passersby. The poster on the right uses comparison to illustrate the benefits of shopping at the Maison du Châtelet. You can see the person on the right uh, is throwing up his hands in surprise when he sees his very stylishly dressed counterpart on the left. The text at the bottom of the poster narrates what they're saying to each other. So the person on the right says, oh, my dear, how you are dressed. Which firm outfitted you? And the person on the left tells him to go to the Maison du Châtelet and he can have the whole outfit for 41 francs. I don't know who you think is better dressed. My husband likes the person on the right better. So. <laughs> And uh, the first department stores in Paris started to open in 1850, and they built on those retailing practices that the Magasin de Nouveauté had introduced. They continued to charge fixed prices, and they also introduced a lot more stylizing in the store. So they had lavish displays of goods in the windows and on the sales floor, and that allowed people to shop freely, browse, and fantasize about what they would buy. The, the poster on the left advertises specific outfits for, that are for sale at the Bouchamont department store, and advertising these specific products allowed people to know what was available, and it also encouraged them to buy those outfits and purchase new clothing more often. The department stores also introduced quite a lot of special entertainment to attract a lot of shoppers and create a very bustling and exciting shopping experience. So they offered things like musical performances, art exhibitions, and sales. And these two posters on the right advertise exhibitions of the upcoming season's fashions. So you could go to the store in October and see what you should wear in the winter, or you could go in March and see what you should wear in the summer. December was an especially busy time for the department stores because people were shopping for Etrin or New Year's gifts. And Chéret's posters for that occasion show all these delighted children who are surrounded by do uh, dolls and toys and sporting equipment. The idea of making children happy by buying them a lot of presents hasn't changed very much in 150 years. The third section of the exhibition is called The Latest Page Turner, and it focuses on the press and serialized novels. Along with all the other things that were changing in Paris at the time, the number of papers in circulation increased quite a lot because the literacy became more widespread and the cost of printing decreased. And newspapers are really the ultimate ephemeral commodity where you're meant to read it, discard it, and buy it again the next day. By 1860, sorry, 1880, Paris had 60 daily papers there was no shortage of choice as to what you would read. And all three of these posters that you're seeing advertise different daily papers. And all three also show the different forms of technology that made it possible for these newspapers to receive and print all the latest news from around the world. So if you look very carefully, you can see that there are telegraph poles and wires in all three of the posters. The one on the left also advertises the paper's use of carrier pigeons, which is a little quaint now, but would have been very useful at the time. And then the poster on the right also has a train in the lower right corner. The middle poster for L'Echo de Paris also lists the paper's slate of writers. You can see that there's a different writer every day of the week, and that would encourage people to buy that paper every day. Because of the number of papers, there was a lot of competition for readers. So many of the different papers started to publish serialized novels to attract and retain subscribers. With that, very popular authors would contribute daily, weekly, or monthly installments of a story. And that created a challenge from a writing standpoint because you needed to create something that was interesting on its own, but you also needed to recall what had happened before and create something suspenseful enough that readers wanted to pick up the next issue. 
because of that fragmented writing schedule, a lot of authors started to rely on action and dialogue and violence in the stories. And you can see that Shokoi's designs for those serialized novels reflect that too. So you'll see lots of people who are fighting or getting shot at or, <laughs> or some other dramatic event. But most of the daily papers that are advertising these posters are available in digital form at the, the National Library of France's website. So I read some of these serialized novels and they are quite dramatic. <laughs> They're a lot like our soap operas today. So in the example on the left, the Cochet de Montmartre is about a coach driver. He's driving his, his coach in Montmartre and he comes upon a scene of a person who's being robbed by this group of criminals. As he gets closer, he sees that one of the criminals is his very own son, so he is already shocked by that. Then he, the person who, sorry, as it turns out, the person who gets attacked was having an affair with the coach driver's wife. And so <laughs> he didn't know about that, but the man who was attacked wrote a letter to the wife saying all of his feelings for her, and while he was attacked, he dropped it on the ground. Some people ran out from a boulangerie because it's France and that's what happens. And they're trying to help the person who's getting attacked. They found the envelope on the ground and they assumed for some reason that it belonged to the coach driver. So they slipped it into his pocket unnoticed. So he's about to read this letter from the person who's having an affair with his wife and learn a new secret about his family in the next installment. So. <laughs> Then on the other end of the spectrum, some of the novels that we think of as classics today were also initially published in serial form. So this poster advertises L'Argent by the noted novelist writer Emile Zola. And L'Argent is, it takes a fictional family to, to consider the difficulties of the stock market and financial speculation in France in the 1860s. So Chéret uses an allegorical figure to represent justice, and she's clutching French franknotes and stock certificates in front, in front of the Paris Stock Exchange building. And on the right is an example of what L'Argent looked like when it first ran in the Giobla paper. Zola so was a very savvy marketer, and he was quite pleased with the posters that Chéret made for him. So he wrote, Chéret made posters that are masterpieces for some of my books. And I find that his art of the poster, so vibrant, so original, has become the charm and the gaiety of our streets. The fourth section of the exhibition is called Voyage, and it's about both real and imagined travel. The rail network in France expanded significantly between 1850 and 1880, and that made it possible for people to travel to destinations more quickly, and it expanded the geographical area that was available to people. Some of Chevalier's advertisements are for specific travel destinations, as is the case for both of these on the screen. Trouville was, is on the northern coast of France, and it was one of the first seaside resorts in the country. You can see that there are, is a family on the beach enjoying their time away from the city. The text in the lower left-hand corner advertises races that will be taking place in Trouville, and it also says how long it will take you to get there from Paris. So it's three and a half hours, which is much faster than previous modes of transportation would have allowed. The poster on the right is for a thermal spa in Vital Vosges, and the many wealthy people would go there to experience the benefits of bathing in and drinking mineral water. For people who couldn't or did not want to leave the city, there were also a number of different forms of entertainment that made you feel as though you'd traveled to another place or time. Both of these posters are for panoramas and dioramas, and those are very popular forms of entertainment that made you feel immersed in a scene with these enormous painted canvases and three-dimensional props and sometimes moving pieces in the floor. The poster on the left is advertising a panorama that's about a specific battle that took place during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 to 1871. The panorama opened 10 years after France had been defeated in the conflict, and the panorama was meant to instill unity and patriotism in the people who saw it. 
The poster on the right advertises a diorama about the Statue of Liberty. So as you probably know, France gave the Statue of Liberty to the United States in recognition of the friendship between the two countries. And at the time this poster was made, the statue was still under construction. And a fundraising committee created a lot of events to try to find the money to complete the monument. So this diorama was one of those fundraising ventures. The poster and the diorama both envisioned the monument in its completed form in its future home in New York Harbor. So going to the diorama would give Parisians the opportunity to both travel to a different place and travel into the future. Probably the most significant attractions at, in Paris at the end of the 19th century were the World's Fairs, and Paris hosted the World's Fairs in 1889 and in 1900. In both of the World's Fairs, there, were, there was a section dedicated to European colonies in Africa, Asia, and Oceania, and there were also pavilions for international performers. This poster advertises an attraction at the 1900 World's Fair that was dedicated to present day Spain and Portugal during the time of Muslim rule. There were quite a lot of different forms of entertainment in that section of the World's Fair. And some of those forms included um, staged battles between Christians and Muslims and also jousts and dancers. So Chaclay, uh, some of the, sorry, some of the um, Publicity about that section of the World's Fair reveals the stereotypes that French people had about Spanish people. So they reference that Spain is a country that's colorful and lively and full of music and dancing. So Chaclay really plays into that idea with this poster that features a bolero dancer who's dressed in a very vibrant yellow costume. And then the last section of the exhibition is called To Your Health and it's about mass-produced consumer products that were coming on the market at this time. And like most of the other things you've seen, it's meant to be purchased and used up and purchased again. So many of these posters feature the Shechet that we talked about earlier, and in this case, her liveliness and energy is meant to point to the effectiveness of the products that she's using. And her appearance in these posters also feeds into government initiatives after the loss of the Alsace region in the Franco-Prussian War, the French government placed a lot of emphasis on health and hygiene in order to create a stronger citizenry who would be ready to go into battle again if another war occurred. And this was especially, uh, this, is, this was a goal for women especially, so they were expected to be clean and have beautiful bodies so they could be healthy and raise strong children, strong families, and good citizens. They used products such as the bath salts on the left and then soap on the right. And this poster for Cosme d'Or Savon is the first one that Jim and Susie Wickman bought in 1983. So it's nice to be able to feature that in the exhibition. The emphasis on health and hygiene also spurred quite a number of new pharmaceutical products that entered the market. There are cough drops on the left and then two advertisements for laxatives on the right. You may never know from looking at them, <laughs> but um, even some alcohols that contained quinine or coca leaf purported health benefits. So Vemeriani was a wine that was fortified with, with coca leaf, and many doctors at the time thought that cocaine was a safe treatment and stimulant. So you can see that Shekhaï is advertising the vitalizing properties of this beverage and that explains why the Chachette is leaping through the air to pour herself another glass. In general, French drinking culture expanded and became quite a bit more social at this time. So you'll see many different advertisements for aperitifs in the exhibition. And we also have a section of the wall that's dedicated to these posters for Saxoline, which is lamp oil. Chachette was quite popular amongst collectors by this time in his career. And these collectors were especially attracted to these posters for Saxoline, which were made between 1891 and 1900. Saxoline was a luxury lamp oil that was purer than kerosene, so it burned more brightly. And Chaclay did a very effective job of showing the superior radiance of Saxoline by showing light and shade on the women's bodies. The person who commissioned these posters was named Maurice Fenay, 
and he hired Chef Faye to create posters for Saxoline and a few of his other brands. And he also gave Chef Faye one of his first decorative arts commissions because he asked him to decorate his dining room in 1895. By that point, Chef Faye had created more than 1,400 different poster designs over the course of his career. And after 1900, he transitioned away from making posters and went more and more into creating decorative arts works. And even though he stopped making posters after 1900, we're lucky to have um, uh, several, several hundred of them in the museum's collection. And I'm glad to be able to show them to you through the exhibition. If you're interested in seeing it in person, we have a few tickets, some tickets set aside for Rotary members at our visitor services desk that will be valid today. So if you want to go down this afternoon and see the show, there will be tickets for you at either of the desks. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. It's a fascinating discussion. I'm just curious how much wall space the Whitmans had. One, yeah. Where did they get the 600 or more copies that they had? Where did they get them? They bought them at auctions in different gallerists. So people that they worked with started to know that they were interested in Chef in particular. So sometimes they would alert them to something that they thought they'd be interested in. But they were also very good at tracking auctions and different galleries themselves and finding what they needed. So Jim told me that eventually he ran out of posters to buy because even though Chef Faye made 1,400 different designs, they're not all coming out on the market. So I think he found everything that he could. But in their home, they weren't all on display. They had some framed and on the walls and other ones were in sleeves in racks that you could look through. So they, they didn't have quite enough wall space for all 600. Hi, I saw the exhibit uh, Sunday. It's just delightful. Thank you. Um, uh, to view. I'm also at the same time had just seen the Winslow Homer exhibit in New York. And like Chavez, he was a lithographer. Did, did Chavez ever go into painting or um, uh, watercolors? And at the time, he, he's there. It's just art is just exploding in France with all the impressionists. And did they take this seriously as art um, versus posters? Mm -hmm. It changed over time how much poster making was considered an art form. And Chalet is one of the people who transformed posters into something that was thought of as an art. Prior to Chalet, as we talked about, the posters were much more text heavy. And Chalet was really the first person to devote a lot of attention to posters and turn them into something very pleasing to look at. And that influenced quite a lot of the artists who came after him. So you probably are more well aware of Ancle de Toulouse-Lautrec, who trained with Chalet at a certain point in his career. So a lot of the poster makers who came after Chalet were influenced by seeing his work in the street. Chalet did transition into also making pastels and watercolors and paintings later in his life. So I think as he gained more critical acclaim, he started to think of himself as more of a fine artist as well. Does that answer your question? I can't. No, I don't know the market for them. So we don't have paintings in the collection, so it's it's mostly posters. Did anyone keep track of the number of posters that were printed of a given type? And is there such a thing as a master uh, that is of more value that was kept separate from the, the ones that are run off the machine? Mm -hmm. so there are recordings on the backs of certain posters that tell the number that were printed. So most posters that you'll find in museums are backed with linen or canvas to help preserve the paper because it's very thin and fragile paper. But there are a few examples that don't have lining on the back in the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris and in the National Library of, Par of France. And those say the number of the posters that were printed and the destination, like the part of the city that they were going to be displayed in. So some of them were a few hundred, some of them went up to several thousand for 
um, especially for books or novels or anything literary, those those posters were printed to quite a few more copies than some of the other products. As far as whether any of them are more valuable than others, there isn't like an original because you would just print, you make the stones and then you just start printing. <laughs> so the value in different impressions of the poster basically at this point comes from its condition and how well preserved it is and how many examples keep coming back on the market. What, if any, relationship was there between the other famous poster maker of this time, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, and Jules Chalet? A, a little bit of one. So Toulouse-Lautrec was working several decades after Chalet started making posters. So Chalet founded his press in 1866. And Toulouse-Lautrec was working in the 1880s and 1890s. So he had been seeing Chalet's posters for years and years. And we also know that Lautrec printed at least one thing with Chalet. So he, he trained in at least some techniques with Chalet. There isn't a lot of documentation of that, but we do know that their paths crossed at least a little bit. But for the most part, the poster makers who are working later that you're more familiar with were also painters, and they're better known as painters. So their poster making activity was conducted alongside their paintings for which they're better known. So I think that's where the difference comes in between Chalet and some of these other artists. They're, they were painting for the market. Chalet was doing more private decorative arts commissions and poster making alone for the most part. Yes. All right, thank you so much.